Good morning. Our text this morning is Psalm 77. Listen now as I read from God's Word. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. In the day of my trouble I seek the Lord. In the night my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn me forever and never again be favorable? Has His steadfast love forever ceased? Are His promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has He in anger shut up His compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightning lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. And we pray today, God, that you would help us to rightly understand your word, that you would apply this word to our hearts, to our lives. Lord God, help us to uh, see that you are a God who never changes. And Lord God, by faith, to remember, to ponder, to meditate upon your greatness, your glory, that our hearts might delight in you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We continue our study most recently, which has been to consider our current situation. Uh, the current situation which leaves uh, many uh, with questions about what to do and how to live, how to trust the Lord in hard times, and what to do with their time now that the time, their schedules are, are thrown off. And one of the other things we've been spending a little bit of time on is uh, how to... Uh, approach the Lord when you feel distant or discouraged or in some other ways uh, not uh, as joyful in the Lord as perhaps you had been in the past. And, and that uh, is our focus for today. This is a, a psalm of lament. It's a psalm that cries out to the Lord, uh, calling for the Lord to hear and help uh, because uh, the psalmist is feeling distant from the Lord and many uh, of us have experienced this at some time or another. Uh, maybe it's happening right now, uh, or maybe it's happened some other time in your life. And if not you, then perhaps this sermon is for you to be a help to someone else, someone else that you may know and love, someone else in our congregation uh, may need uh, the sort of ministry of the word and your presence and your counsel, and uh, this word will come and bless you that you might turn and bless others. Uh, but uh, you won't have to live long before you find that this is the word that you need for yourself. Uh, we experience uh, times when we have sweet fellowship with the Lord and we have times in which we feel distant from the Lord or the Lord feels distant from us. And that's the situation in which the psalmist uh, finds himself. Well, I want to begin uh, just by seeing uh, the first section of this psalm, the first nine verses. And in these first nine verses, we see uh, the psalmist calling on God when God feels distant. Uh, and we see, uh, just as we sort of give an overview of what we uh, have going on here in these first three verses, he's crying out to God, aloud to God. He, he wants to know, will God hear me? Uh, he's seeking the Lord. His right hand is stretched out without wearing, so he just seems to be going after the Lord again and again. Uh, and he is not comforted. 
Uh, he remembers God's, uh, and yet his spirit faints. And so we see here the psalmist is in a bad place, in a hard place, in a difficult place, a place in which uh, he is not satisfied with where he is, and he's making some attempt. He's, he's crying out to God, and this is a positive thing to do. He's crying out to God, and yet even there, he is not finding immediate relief. Uh, he's finding that he's crying out, and he's, he's not getting the satisfaction uh, that he's after so far. And so uh, this is where we find uh, the psalmist uh, crying out to God. He has trouble sleeping, according to verse 4. He just, he's not sure if he can, um, if he's going to recover. And, and by the time we get to the end of this first section, verses 7 through 9, there's some pretty hard questions he's asking. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love never ceased? I'm sorry, has his steadfast love forever ceased? And of course, th this, this would be impossible. He's crying, he's asking, has steadfast love stopped? Of course, steadfast love never stops. And so we have a psalmist who is feeling quite distant from the Lord and has been, in a sense, uh, doing what he can do, doing what, what comes to mind in terms of uh, stirring himself up to, to turn to the Lord, to look to the Lord. And yet he, in, in his feelings, he just feels very far from the, lo the Lord. And again, uh, perhaps some of you can uh, connect with this. Uh, perhaps some of the, this resonates with some of you. you. You're crying out to God. He feels distant. And, uh, and we come to the end of this section with the psalmist just really uh, longing uh, for help, uh, calling for help. And yet the, the help isn't coming quickly. And if any of you have ever uh, gone through a dark time uh, in your life, uh, you, you'll know, uh, you'll be able to attest, uh, that time doesn't end as quickly as you'd like it to. Uh, you, you might call, you might fumble about, you might tr try what you may, and yet you remain in that season. Uh, and this is, again, something that we can identify with and we can uh, uh, see and understand what the psalmist perhaps is going through. One of the things that I want us to do is just reflect a little bit on this section before we move on. Uh, we should think... Uh, that the present struggle then is a particular challenge for the psalmist because the psalmist has known better days. Uh, and what we mean by better days is that the psalmist has known a closer walk with the Lord, uh, the joy of close fellowship with the Lord. And, and of course, if you're just reading the Psalms, you can see that, 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 that although there are many laments in the Psalms, there are many great uh, expressions of joy and expressions of delight in the, in the Lord. And so the psalmist knows what it is to have close fellowship with Lord, the Lord. And now that he is not experiencing that, uh, the loss of that, the absence of that is a particular pain to him, right? If, if fellowship, close fellowship with the Lord that gives his soul joy, if that's the greatest joy you can know, then if you don't have it, you miss it. And, and this, again, explains the pain. Why is it so difficult for the psalmist? Uh, we may see that there are circumstances going on. Uh, we may see there's actually reason to believe that, uh, although we don't know all the details, perhaps uh, the psalmist is uh, recognizing that he has been in sin, although we, we don't have a lot of information about that. Perhaps he is in sin. Perhaps it's his own doing uh, that has got him into the place. But we don't know all the details, but... But here we find that he has known at some point in his life close, joy-giving fellowship with the Lord, and now he does not have it. And, and the absence of that is a particular pain to him, a particular difficulty for him. And so he then, uh, lacking this joyful fellowship with God, he just pours out his soul to the Lord. He, he just says, Lord, uh, hear me, help me. I don't want to stay where I am. And so he just, he just honestly, we see this as an honest pouring out of his soul to the Lord. And again, this would just be a good advice for us. If we find ourselves in a, in a place where we don't want to be, we feel distant from the Lord, we should cry out to the Lord. We should honestly call on him and, and recognize that he can uh, restore that fellowship uh, restore joy to our lives from that fellowship. And so we, all we can do is cry out to Him. And yet what we want to say here is the main thing that uh, we ought to be crying out for, though, is the joy-giving presence. It's, it's not 
uh, mainly a, my circumstances are bad and I need good circumstances, but rather uh, I feel distant from you and I want to feel close. Uh, and so, uh, among all the things that we uh, pray for and seek uh, from the Lord, uh, we should seek this close fellowship that gives joy to our soul. And we see the psalmist going after that. So, in our discouragement, we, though, ought to find rest in God's uh, sovereign working of all things. And this is one of the ways we want to kind of end this first section, is to think that we need not to say, well, I'm in a bad spot and I'm going to be angry with God. I'm going to be really upset with God. It's your fault. You're the one who's led me here, right? So we don't say, well, God is in charge. God is a sovereign over all things. And here I am uh, not experiencing joy in my fellowship with him. So, so God, you're to blame. Uh, no, we recognize that we are sinful. Uh, and yet we recognize that God is... Um, a powerful, good, sovereign Lord, and we look to Him uh, for our deliverance. Uh, one uh, missionary, uh, early American missionary, David Brainerd, uh, he was a missionary to uh, American Indians in the 18th century. Uh, he oftentimes uh, battled uh, discouragement and depression uh, in his uh, work among, uh, in his missionary work, and, uh, and Jonathan Edwards uh, wrote, uh, a bit of his biography or uh, commented within uh, the journals that he had uh, after, after David Brainerd passed away. And uh, he records this. He, we have this from David Brainerd's own recordings. He says, The next five days he was for the most part in a de dejected, depressed state of mind, and sometimes extremely so. He speaks of God's waves and billows rolling over his head, and of his being ready sometimes to say, surely his mercy is clean gone forever. That's actually uh, Psalm 77, 8. Or uh, he will be favorable no more, Psalm 77, 7. And so he's using really the words of the psalm to express uh, the sorrow that he feels, that David Brainerd personally was feeling. And says the anguish he endures was nameless and inconceivable, but at the same time speaks thus, concerning his distress. What God designs by all my distresses, I know not, but this I know. I deserve them all and thousands more. And so he, he, he recognizes, look, God is not being unfair. <laughs> for, for God to feel distant from me and for me to be in a hard place, this is not God being unfair to me as if he owes me better than what I have. I know that I don't even deserve as good as I have it right now. And so there's a, there's a resting in the Lord. There's a, there's a a, an assurance that the Lord always is doing what is right. And this is the way we must uh, approach the Lord, not with an ac accusation against the Lord as if he's done something wrong, but a recognition that we are sinners and that he is holy and he does nothing wrong. And one other thing we need to think about, though, is that the Lord means for us to miss his close fellowship. And, uh, and John Flavel helps us think about this. He points us then in the right direction. It is a greater mercy to have a heart willing to refer all to God and to be at His dispose than to enjoy presently the mercy we are most eager and impatient for. Right? So we want things to change. And honestly, it's better for us to say, Lord, your will be done. <laughs> Lord, I know you're good. Lord, I'm going to wait on you to help me in my trouble. Better for us to just rest and let God have his will and his way in our life than, than to have uh, the deliverance uh, from our trouble. Uh, and so we need to learn uh, in our troubles uh, not to look on the situations mainly, uh, but to recognize that w what's really at stake and the most important thing at stake is our own fellowship with the Lord and look to the Lord and call out to the Lord and trust the Lord in our difficult times. Well, we see the psalmist then come to uh, a bit of a turning point here in the middle of the psalm, around verse 10. Um, the turning point is where he remembers God's faithful deeds, verses 10 through 12. The turning point we can see then is verse 10. He says, then I said. So, so he has this, this despair, and he comes, uh, he recounts the despair, and, and then he says, and then I said. And he says there in verse 10, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work 
and meditate on your mighty deeds. And so we see here this turning point. Uh, and what the turning point does is it turns from the feelings, right? The, the psalmist felt, right? Feelings, the feelings that the psalmist had uh, to the truth of who God is, the reality of what he has done. He's been faithful for the, over the years. If generation after generation, the Lord has been faithful. I feel a particular way, uh, but the problem is not with uh, the Lord. He, he's the same. He remains the same. The problem is with me and my feelings at this time and my own sin, my own distance that I feel. But the problem is not with the Lord. The Lord himself is unchanging. And again, he reflects of the years that the Lord has worked by his right hand. And it speaks of the mighty acts of God. And so uh, what is in view here is the actions of God. God has been faithful. So he says, he, he stops just thinking about how he's feeling. And he begins to say, let me think about God. Let me stop thinking about me. Let me start thinking about God. And again, that's his great advice for when we are in a difficult place. Get our thoughts off of ourselves, mainly fixating on ourselves, and turn our thoughts to the Lord. And so he says, uh, I remember that you're faithful, uh, and you have... Uh, done mighty things, and he reflects on that throughout the, really the rest of the psalm. We'll see him speaking about uh, how the Lord was faithful through Moses and through Aaron. Uh, we'll get to that soon. But right now he's remembering the deeds of the Lord. Again, verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. And this is the way that we ought to act. We ought to remember the deeds of the Lord. Psalm 143 verse 5 says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the works of your hands. Or Romans 15, 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So what we want to think about here is a couple of things. Uh, meditating on what the Lord has done, but the, the way that, that Romans 15 says is that we think about these things, we should be encouraged by the Scripture in order that we would have hope. So there's a remembering, but it's not just a bare remembering, like I'm just going to remember a few things and then that'll help. Uh, rather, it's I'm going to remember some things toward, moving toward hoping in the Lord. I'm going to remember how faithful he is so that I can again hope in him. It's as if in the first several verses, the psalmist had lost hope. And perhaps you've lost hope. But, but what we're being called to do then is to remember the Lord, not just as, okay, I'm going to make sure I read the Bible and, and get some more knowledge in my head, but I'm going to reflect on what God has done in such a way that it moves my heart away from hopelessness to solid hope in the Lord. It's, a, it's an intentional remembering. You're remembering for a purpose to move your heart from hopelessness to hope in the Lord. So again, this is not a basic remembering, but an intentional striving. And just notice these words that show up in verses 11 and 12. The word remember shows up twice in verse 11. And in verse 12, he says, I will ponder. And later in verse 12, he says, I will meditate. And just by these various ways of speaking about uh, how he's going to think about what God has done, there is work involved on the part of the psalmist. There is lots of work. There's lots of effort being put in on his own part just in terms of knowing that his own reflections on what God has done by remembering, meditating, pondering what the Lord has done. He knows that this will do his soul some good. And so he's remembering, he's pondering, he's meditating to move his heart by God's help that God might move his heart through this remembering, uh, move his heart to joy in the Lord. And so uh, there's action here. He's not, he's not being passive. He's being active here. And the psalmist, again, is striving after a renewed fellowship with the Lord. Remember what he lost? He lost the joy of that fellowship with the Lord. He wants it back. And so he's going to actively pursue the Lord. And I just encourage you, if you're feeling distant from the Lord, uh, <laughs> then uh, let him know that you miss the fellowship and then go after him. Right? This is what we see the psalmist doing. I miss your fellowship. I miss being close with you and I'm going, off, going after you. And so uh, it's then as if God, uh, as if he's saying, God, I'm going to gaze at you and then I'm going to wait on you to help me, to stir me up, to stir up my heart, uh, to, to worship you, to honor you, to have joy in you. And so uh, we know, again, that God is glorious, but at this point the psalmist feels far from the Lord, but he wants to feel close to the Lord. And what he, again, another thing we might say that he's saying is the defect is not in you, God. The defect is in me. I am not rightly 
thinking about you, and, and, I'm, and I mean to rightly think about you. I mean to reflect on your greatness and on your glory. And I also recognize, by crying out to you, I recognize the power, even though I, I, we're talking about pursuing the Lord, the power is in the Lord, not in us. So we do pursue the Lord, but we pursue it in a dependence on Him. This is why we cry out. This is why we pray. <laughs> I'm going to pursue you, but can you help me come closer to you? Right. So, so the getting closer to the Lord requires the power of the Lord to bring us close to Him. Draw nigh to the Lord, He will draw nigh to you. We, we pull close to Him, and then He pulls us close. So we ought to pursue Him, but we ought not to pursue Him in a way as if we are in charge of whether or not we have close fellowship with Him. Uh, rather, we cry out to Him. We recognize it's a privilege. It's not, a, it's not what we're owed. Uh, it's an honor uh, that the Lord in His kindness bestows on us. So we honor him by pursuing him, and we also honor him by praying in such a way that we recognize that that close fellowship will only come by his power, by his work. And so uh, Martin Luther perceived uh, this sort of a thing uh, in his own uh, reflection on this psalm. He says, to remember the works of the Lord is not a bare contemplation of them, right? We're not just thinking, okay, well, he went through the Red Sea, and remember how they fed him the manna? Like, it's, it's not just a bare reflection on the truths, right? But always to thank him in them, and thus through them to place one's hope in God, to fear him, to love him, seek him, and to hate evil and flee sin. And there's a lot in there that we don't have time to unpack, but, but Luther sees that what we're doing, we're not just merely reflecting on what God has done. We're doing it because we want a close walk with Him, right? We want to fear Him. We want to love Him. We want to seek Him. We want to hate sin. We want to put sin away. We want all of those things. So in our contemplating Him, in our remembering and pondering, it is a seeking of a close fellowship with the Lord. And so we see that turn happen here in the middle of the psalm. Well, he then moves uh, for, from verses 10 through 12, he moves uh, in, in this last section, verses 13 through 20, to recounting God's faithfulness to God. It's an interesting turn that happens here around verse 13, where he says, uh, he says, your way. So he's talking about, uh, he's crying out in the first section, right? And then in the next section, uh, he says, um, I'm going to appeal. I will remember. So he's talking about himself. And now in verse 13, he begins to say, your way, O God. Verse 14, you are the God. Verse 15, with your arm. So he's talking to the Lord. He's talking to the Lord about the Lord. Lord, <laughs> you are the God who did this. You are the God who did that. You are the God. Right? So he's addressing the Lord. He's recounting the greatness of the Lord to the Lord. He's addressing the Lord. And in this way, though, he's stirring up his own heart to remember the great things that God has done. Why is God so great? Why would he want close fellowship with this God? Because he's so wonderful. His excellencies are, are able to be recounted again. And we could just go on and on and on reflecting on all the great things that God has done. And so this is what the psalmist is doing. Again, he's, he's praying, he's seeking the Lord, but he's doing it by reflecting on the greatness of the Lord. Right? So our close fellowship with Him, our close joy in Him comes not from uh, just working ourselves up, uh, but rather waiting on the Lord and looking to the Lord and then remembering what the Lord has done and remembering why is it that we love Him? Why is it that we love Him so much? Well, because He's been so faithful. He, he has steadfast love. He's, he's never done wrong, right? And we can recount and we ought to recount His glorious character to Him, His glorious activities to Him. Uh, that we might praise him and that we might have our hearts thereby stirred up to a closer joy, uh, a closer fellowship with him, more joy in him. So uh, he says, uh, after he says, after he begins to address the Lord, he says, uh, what God is great like our God? There's no God like our God. There's, there's no God who compares to our God. And the Bible is, loves this theme. Right, this theme that there's no God like our God. Psalm 148, 13. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He is great. He is the great God. Uh, Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Right? There's nobody as great as God. There's nobody like Him. Nobody compares. No one should have first place in your heart and your affections above God because no one is like Him. Nothing compares to Him. <laughs> 
Isaiah 40, 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop up from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. They're, just amass everything on the world together. The nations, the greatest nations, they're just like a little speck of dust. They, they can't compare to the weight and the glory of our God. And so we remind ourselves of the greatness of God, that our hearts might be drawn toward Him. And then as our hearts are drawn toward Him, we would have joy in Him and in our fellowship with Him. So the effect, again, of these texts are not only to remember the facts about God, but to rehearse His greatness, that we will rejoice in Him, that we will praise Him. Jonathan Edwards says, There is glory sufficient in these things exceedingly to delight our souls. Right? We reflect on the greatness of God so that our soul delights in Him and raises them to the highest possible pitch of joy and praise. We reflect on His glory so that we might have joy, we might praise Him, we might s rejoice to sing His praises. This is, what we, this is the sort of work that we want the Lord to do, but we do it by reflecting on His great glories. And, and the way the psalmist does it, I'm just going to briefly point this out, the way the psalmist does it is by really just rehearsing the exodus. Uh, some, some have called the Exodus that great act of redemption in the Old Testament. It's a picture of the sort of redemption that Christ will one day bring, but it's, it's the great act of redemption in the Old Testament. And, uh, and the word redemption even shows up in our text. With your arm you redeemed your people, right? So re the word redemption even shows up here. And so uh, we have then uh, reference to the, the, a path through the water, and so uh, we would rightly think then that what's going on in these verses, verses 14 toward the end of the, of, the, of the chapter, are just a recounting of the way that God was faithful to his people to deliver them through Moses and Aaron. And those, of course, are the two individuals uh, identified in verse 20. And so this is just a recounting of the Exodus. And the wonderful thing about the Exodus is that God acted in such a way that everybody else, the other nations, would notice how great he is. And actually, the Bible attests to the fact that it worked. Uh, in the beginning of the book of Joshua, uh, when the people enter into the land and they're, they're uh, getting ready to take uh, Jericho, here in Joshua chapter 2 it says, We have heard, verse, uh, chapter 2 verses 10 and 11 of Joshua, We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. Right? They'd heard about that. Right? And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So God meant to act. He acted so that it would have an effect on others, and it, it worked. People were afraid, not just of God's people, they were afraid of their God, God Himself. Right? Uh, another uh, place that testifies that God was meaning to show His glory in this is Exodus 9, 16. But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. He was talking to an unbelieving king, and he's saying, I raised you up, king, so that I could show my power. <laughs> and so the Lord acts in such a way so that others will recognize the great acts that he does and fear him and uh, give, him the, give him the recognition that he deserves for being as powerful and good and holy and righteous as he is. And, and so what we find here at the end of this section then, or, or as we are coming kind of toward the end here, is that the psalmist is pursuing the Lord in his dark times. He's, he's in a bad place. He's not having close fellowship with the Lord. He's crying out to the Lord. He's telling the Lord his troubles. And yet one central to his uh, crying out to the Lord is, yes, a prayer of crying out, but also a remembering, a pondering, a meditating on the great things that God has done. There are so many great things to meditate upon. And again, we do well to learn from this. We ought to meditate on the great things that our God has done, both individually in your own life and at what he's done uh, for his people, as recorded in the scriptures, what he's done uh, for uh, his people through just history, as we've seen even from the time of the New Testament to today. We can see that the Lord has been uh, faithful. And, of course, we have more to remember. Uh, this is just where this text is going. What the psalmist is able to remember is, is uh, not as much as we have to remember, right? We get to remember the things that happened after this psalm was written. Uh, very likely this was written before uh, the, uh, 
The exile, we get, to remember, we get to remember the way the Lord brought his people back out of exile. Uh, we get to remember the way the Messiah came into the world. We get to see, remember the way that uh, this uh, Messiah came and lived a perfect life. We get to remember the way that he uh, went up into heaven and the way the Holy Spirit came into the world. We get to remember the way that, that uh, his people are the, are the ministers of a new covenant. Uh, we get to remember uh, the way that he... Uh, uh, worked in uh, the, the early church as we have it recorded there in uh, the New Testament books. Uh, we get to remember the way that he's worked down through the centuries, uh, thousands of years since Jesus has departed. Uh, the gates of hell have not prevailed against the church. The Lord is building the church. And so we have so many things to reflect upon that we do well as we uh, find ourselves uh, feeling far from the Lord, feeling distant from the Lord. We have many and wonderful things that we can reflect on the Lord, to, that the Lord might stir up our hearts to remember how good He is, how great He is, how glorious He is. And just as we reflected on the great act of redemption at the end of Psalm 77, we do well to reflect on the great act of redemption of all time, that is, in Jesus Christ, how He lived the perfect life, died in our place, died bearing our sin and our punishment, rising again to defeat sin and death, to break our slavery to sin, uh, to give us new hearts, uh, new, new lives and uh, giving us a, a ministry of reconciliation and awaiting uh, the return of Jesus Christ where we will come, he will come and bring us to himself and we will live with him forever. We have so many wonderful things to reflect upon. And I just urge you, brothers and sisters, as you think about uh, your own struggles, <laughs> uh, don't struggle by focusing on you. Uh, struggle <laughs> by, and, and then don't struggle by resting in you. Uh, Struggle by calling out to the one who is powerful because you're not, and struggle by turning your eyes off of you and on to the Lord and remember his glories. That you, as you reflect on his glories, will find your heart going out to him and you find your heart drawn close to him. And by his power, not yours, but by his power, you will find joy even for your darkest days. And I urge you to consider this not just a helpful practice on your dark days, this is, this is a great practice for every day. Every day we ought to be in God's Word. Every day, whether it's a good day or a bad day, we ought to be in God's Word. We ought to be calling out to Him. We ought to be seeking Him. We ought to be remembering the glorious things He has done. Not just as, you know, make sure you read your Bible every day, but as a way to call out to the Lord, Lord, work through this Word to draw my heart to You, to, to draw my heart away from the world, draw my heart to You, give me close fellowship with You, give me a great and proper understanding of how wonderful you are, and may I find my joy in you, and may I know joy all my days because of your greatness as I reflect on your greatness. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your, uh, the way this psalmist struggles, for the way this psalmist shows us that sometimes we will struggle, and sometimes we will struggle for a long period of time to no avail, it appears. And thank you, Lord God, for the way that we see this psalmist struggling by leaning on you, not himself. And the way that he struggles, not by looking to himself, but by turning his eyes to you and finding help from you as he reflects on your excellencies, on your glory. Lord God, may we learn to follow this same example, to turn to you, to look to you, to find our joy in you, and to find that you are there, powerful to answer. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.